Welcome and thank you. It was, a, it was a, an, an awesome introduction. I'm really pleased to, to be here talking to you about it. Um, I'm very comfortable sharing a lot about the lessons that I've learned through growing and scaling our business um, from, again, a kind of small uh, insurance operation to, you know, this sort of national, international, uh, and kind of global player now. We insure vehicles in 70 countries. Um, so getting there, um, almost as many as I think I had to go to as a YPO chairman this last year. And when Kyle and I talked about it, I said, happy to talk about the business, happy to give some ideas, um, you know, happy to kind of share some conclusions that I have um, drawn from my experience of scaling this business. But to not talk a little bit about my experience in YPO, I think would be a loss for a, you know an audience who's about business. Um, you know, YPO is a 68-year-old organization. It now has um, 25,000 uh, members in 130 countries with a total uh, corporate revenue represented by those members of about $7 trillion. And, uh, you know, for one year, I was able to lead that organization, and I got to meet some pretty cool people along the way. So I wanted to share some of those stories uh, with you if it's interesting and, and happy to kind of riff on, on all of it. And then at the end, we'll have some time for um, Q&A. That sound good? Um, so why the road to excellence? I'm going to maybe answer it a little bit at the end, but um, it's, it's fair to say that um, you heard a little bit about my educational background. I have a pretty unconventional educational background. This isn't a big story about me, but I have a couple of funny pictures about my, my past that um, hopefully will illustrate it. But uh, when I was doing my doctoral work in, in philosophy, I also did a master's in classics, which is ancient Greek and Latin. And so I usually am just boring my friends and family to death with um, all these um, you know ancient sort of phrases. But excellence in ancient Greek uh, means something different than it does today. It's the concept is called arete, A-R-E-T-E -E is kind of how we'd spell it in English. And it's this idea of sort of a life well lived and it's about the idea of improving every day. And you know, I, I'm a one page plan believer, I'll talk about our company one page plan, but I have a one page plan for myself um, that I work on. I have two different executive coaches that I work with for different dimensions of my thinking. And, you know, every year it's about my, my path to Arete, my path to excellence. How can I live a little bit better every day? How can I grow myself so that I can continue to be worthy to lead this great organization and to be, you know, get to meet some of the cool people we get to meet. So sounds cool. I'll kind of move on. So um, I guess um, since this is a, a mentoring organization, and I believe a lot in mentoring. I mentioned I have, you know, I have a couple of coaches. I mentor a couple of people that I've met through the YPO world and some who have just approached me around it. I'm a really, I'm a believer in that as a process. Um, and so a, a couple of, just to, I want to level set you on the tone of some of these slides and the way I'll approach this is that um, I'm just going to pretend that, that some of the messages I'm telling you, I'm not telling you to do it. You decide whether you want to do it. I'm telling this guy, that's me when I was like seven or eight years old, um, dreaming, looking up at the sky, that I wish I could have gone back sometimes and told him, you know, hey, just remember this stuff as you're going through this. You could shortcut a lot of your pain and agony uh, because you can, you can teach knowledge, but you can't teach wisdom. Um, you know, wisdom is something you have to learn through sort of hard knocks. Um, so, you know, if I could have even shortcutted some of it by a couple of years, I think it probably would have helped me. Um, so uh, next is, you know, I must say growing up in a small town like Traverse City, again, growing from that uh, little kid there lying in the grass is, you know, you all have to have your heroes. You all have to have something to aspire to. Traverse City is a beautiful place. It's always been a beautiful place. But it was not a very cosmopolitan place. And while my family traveled a little bit, you know, it was, it was through this, you know, sort of limited window of things like, frankly, watching James Bond movies with my dad that I realized that's who I wanted to be. I really wanted to be James Bond. I wanted to have that 1964 Aston Martin DB5. Um, but there weren't a lot of Aston Martin DB5s kicking around uh, Traverse City, Michigan. And even though my dad was a hobbyist in the wooden boat space and in the collector car space, and both of my older sisters, 9 and 11 years old, uh, older than I am, when they were about 13 years old, picked out an old car out of the newspaper and restored it in the garage with my dad. Um, I knew that it was probably unlikely that I would become a, a secret agent or that I would ever have an Aston Martin. Um, although I'll tell you, I did end up with the Aston Martin, but that's a different story. <laughs> Um, uh, I should have brought a picture of that. I, actually, I didn't throw it in because this was getting too long. Um, so my, I guess there are a couple of threads to start stringing together is, is that that is uh, January of 1980 and I had just turned 13 years old and that is the day I got my first car. 
In that snowbank behind me is a 1967 Porsche 911 S. And um, it was strangely um, stuck in this, you know, this is East Bay, by the way. So somebody just said they built a house on East Bay up in Traverse City, and that's looking out on Bluff Road. And so there are two Porsches there. And so I bought my car for $500. We bought the pair for $1,000, and he threw in a wooden boat uh, to go with it. And that 500 bucks was my lawn mowing money, and I spent the next couple of years restoring with my dad in the garage. So it was the beginning of a thread that I never thought would become my life. Um, and I'm so glad to say that I still have that car. Um, and I never expect, it doesn't, and people are like, well, what's it worth? I don't care. It's worth 500 bucks. Uh, I know it's worth a lot more than that, but this is my, I grew up with this car and we had, we had a long story together. I was also an entrepreneur and I had great hair, which really ticks me off. <laughs> um, so that's me also a little bit older about uh, early high school. My first business was an apple orchard. My parents had some land. I wanted to have, start some sort of a business. And my dad convinced me that I should plant an orchard. I planted the first espalier style apple orchard in northern Michigan, which is you grow the trees on wires like you would grapes. Um, and I learned a lot about business. Again, more lawn mowing money. I had to buy a pickup truck. I had to buy 600 apple trees and an irrigation system and uh, try to figure out how to make money doing this. And uh, quick quick story, I, I realized that, um, you know, I, I was also into sports and I played music and all this stuff, so the only way you can sell apples in the fall in a place like Traverse City is to go to the farmer's market, and I, probably everybody's been to a farmer's market, but when you try to go sell something in the farmer's market, and you're not really a farmer, you don't have that much to sell. I only had apples. You show up at 5 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning, and you get put in the back row. You are going to be so far away from the traffic, you're never going to sell your apples. So a few... Um, you know, weeks into this, I thought, that sucks, by the way, it's early, you're in high school, is I took our 1933 Ford truck, which I learned to drive in, and I loaded up these wooden apple crates in the back, and I here's this now 16-year-old kid showing up with his apples in this cool old truck, and I got front and center right in the middle of the farmer's market. It was like a display, and I sold out by 9 a.m., and I could sell my, my apples for about a dollar more per bushel of everybody else, just by the way I was displaying. It was a really important business lesson for me. If there's anything I learned about this whole period of time is, is that, quite honestly, it's really hard to make money selling apples, but it's a lot easier when you're into the truck. So I kept the truck, got rid of the apples, and life is pretty good so far. Um, but then I took a little bit of turn. After college, I studied English and philosophy out of Pepperdine University in the warmest small college place I could find in the continental United States, Malibu, California. And uh, loved that. I ended up going not because of my family background. I was just kind of interested in it to New York. I did my uh, master's. I went to seminary for three years at St. Vladimir's Russian Orthodox Theological Seminary. I didn't become a priest. I did kind of dabble with the idea, honestly. But I learned a lot about leadership there. Um, there's, uh, you know, in some of these fantastic, um, you know, in this case, very ancient um, religious community, there's some fascinating views of leadership. It was also my first opportunity to really mix with people from different cultures, dramatically different cultures than my own. Most of the people there were from Eastern Europe, all around the Mediterranean, Syrians, my first sort of interaction personally with people who were Arabs, Arab Christians in this case, and even a bunch of Eskimos from Alaska, all who were, had been converts from the Russians that first went over from, from Alaska. Again, it kind of built on itself. Um, but, you know, it's kind of my life, you know, back all the way through it, there were, I was sort of boats and cars, there was restoring that 9-11, uh, my mom and dad who started the business, um, and it, it just kind of, you know, grew up in the basement of our house, literally it was the basement of my parents' house that the business started in, we, my parents treated it, they had sold their general insurance agency out of Traverse City, they never thought this would be a business that could happen at scale, that, but it had three key ideas behind it. In the late 1970s, early 80s, for those of you who might remember or just have heard about it, the recession that hit Michigan was probably worse than the last recession. It was the first bloodletting of the auto industry. Um, the auto industry has been pretty poorly run since almost the beginning in the United States. And, um, you know, the estimates are that unemployment in the state of Michigan went well into the 20%. And so even places like Traverse City were affected by it. So it didn't matter whether you ran a store, you ran a little insurance agency or whatever. Like, it was lights out for a lot of companies. My parents were lucky to get out from underneath the general insurance agency um, because they were, it was too broad, it was too diverse, and it was too exposed to the local economy. So my dad, I was thought if we could do something, there were already people insuring classic cars around the country. Nobody was insuring wooden boats. He thought, you know, if I could restart a business, it would be national, it would be personal lines, which means insuring an individual, and 
um, it would be some sort of niche, right? So he thought wooden boats. National was great, although people weren't buying a lot of insurance through the mail at that time, and there was no internet in 1982, three. And, uh, but yet this idea of large numbers of small transactions spread out over a large geography, he th it was the thing he dreamed about in the business that he could never have. And what this, the wooden boat business did um, was provide that. And it was also an absolutely unmet need. There was no insurance organization out there insuring classic boats at the time. They were considered too risky. We knew that it was about passion, people the way people take care of these, that the risk would be low. And once we convinced an insurance company to take the risk, we, sent, we put a business card size ad in the back of a hobby wooden boat magazine, and the rest was history. We, and over the next eight or nine years, we insured uh, 60 or 70 percent of the wooden boats in the United States. Um, and it was from there that my sisters and I kind of got in the business, involved in the business on the side all through my going to graduate school. And we started the car business based upon the urging of a bunch of our marine customers who said, we have cars too, you guys should go into it, you're so nice, you just, you're so much nicer than everybody else that was in the space. And that idea in the back of being kind, of treating people with passion was a core idea of why we were successful in the early days. Um, we started the I'm just going to give you some quick stats. We started the, um, the car insurance business technically in 1991. Turned out to be a brutal decision in so many ways. Much more expensive, much more difficult from a regulatory standpoint to insure cars across state lines. It's a highly regulated business. It's better now, actually, than it was then. There were a lot of states that were very protectionist about their local providers. Um, so highly regulated. There were lots of competitors in the space. So we did exactly for anybody who is... Um, read the blue ocean strategy books, we just jumped right into the red ocean, you know, and just got chewed alive for a couple of years until we stumbled on a couple of things that I want to share with you about how we just changed the game. And it's really been this momentum that we've been carrying forward since the late 90s until today. And so today, um, you know, as you, you heard Kyle mention some of the stats, you know, a thousand employees, we insure about a million and a half vehicles in the United States and Canada. It's about $50 billion worth of cars. Um, we're growing at about 20, 21% a year. We'll do that again this year. Um, hopefully more on the revenue than the employee side, as much as I love employing a lot of cool people. Um, but we've been growing a lot of capabilities too. He mentioned a lot of those adjacent businesses that we've started. In addition, we started off as an insurance agency. Now we own the insurance underwriting company as well as the reinsurance company that stands behind us. Um, and that's been sort of a long-standing dream of mine of going from just a seller of what we do to a manufacturer so that we could start building the balance sheet and strengthening our financial position and value over time. So pretty amazing. I mean, I get to insure now, when I just think about the car side of the business, the most valuable cars in the world. And it's taken me all over the place to do all these pretty phenomenal things. It's, um, it's honestly pretty cool. But whether it was just out in Seattle, whether you're talking to one of the Microsoft billionaires and they're four or five hundred million dollar collections or just the guy with the 56, uh, you know, Thunderbird or the 65 Mustang, they're all the same. It's just a passion for this, this auto, you know, for automobiles and it's just has a couple more zeros attached to it for, for some of those people. So it's been a, been a pretty fascinating journey. Um, so where I, what I thought I'd do is I just want to share a couple of lessons with you about kind of how we did it in these three dimensions. And I'll add kind of a partial fourth dimension, which I'm going to call governance in the middle of it, because um, I've come to understand governance a little bit differently, both in my business, but also in my experience in YPO that I'll share with you. <laughs> YPO has a 22-member board all of 22 CEOs who all love hearing themselves talk. Um, <laughs> Really awesome, effective way to run it. And, and then there are 10 standing committees of the YPO board and 154 members on those committees. The most ridiculous, overwrought, overweight governance structure ever. So one of my first missions as chairman last year is I cut the committees and the size of the committees in half. I'm like, <laughs> we can do much better than this. Um, but this is kind of the dimension is, you know, you have obviously in an organization like ours, you have a company of sort of the operations, the company side, you have the, the culture and the brand. So let's start with the fun stuff. Let's talk about the brand first. So um, Haggerty is generally viewed as having, I mean, kind of a, a real breakaway brand in the, in the vehicle space. I mean, there are not a lot of people that love their insurance providers. Um, but something I'll tell you about in a little bit, we're a, we're a big measurement company. We measure everything about our business. We measure our culture. Um, we measure our brand strength. We're constantly testing engagement stores. And obviously, we, um, we measure our... Um, 
our financial performance, but this is just an example out of Pebble Beach. Years ago, I discovered there's this whole thing before dawn at about five in the morning. The first people come out to see the cars come out of the Pebble Beach Concours and to see the car, catch the first glimpse of the cars. It was kind of a sleepy affair until I decided to put some coffee down there and just make it a little bit more pleasant at four or five in the morning. And then we started producing these hats, these little Dawn Patrol hats, one of my employees handing it out. And so the sort of dozen or so people that started there now, now today, I think this last year we had about 4,000 people show up at five in the morning to try to get one of our 500 limited edition Dawn Patrol hats. Um, town and country said that it is the ultimate object if you're in the car world to get one of our Dawn Patrol hats because it shows how you're on the, um, you are truly on the inside. And they sell for between $500 and $1,000 a piece on eBay uh, within the day. And this is a $3 hat. Um, so this is the type of things that uh, you know we, we like to build and we like to do. So here are a couple of lessons and I want to share some examples. Um, this comes out of a, one of the books called the Eating the Big Fish that's on your list. I provided a list this kind of of books that have kind of either helped me develop or helped us build um, the business. The concept of being a challenger brand is very much in our space. We've we, you know, we weren't the leader at the beginning. We're now the runaway leader in, in our, in just in the vintage car insurance world. We're larger than everyone put together in it. Uh, a lot of that stems from the fact that we turned most of our competitors into partners. Um, didn't have to, I never, we've never acquired a single business in the space. I don't believe in it. I don't think you can do, I mean, in our space, I don't think we could ever do it well. I can grow organically faster than anybody else can because we outlearn them. Um, but I turned all of our big competitors, the all states, the nationwides, the progressives, the, um, they all, if they sell a classic car insurance policy, it's sold through us, through the back door. So all the big behemoths out there have become our partners through the years. And a lot of it is we treated ourselves like a challenger brand. You always kind of want to have that little bit of an underdog feeling to what you do in my space. Again, you know, this is my, my lecture to my eight-year-old self. Um, because you never, it's great to be the leader, but you just don't, never want to act like it. You know, keeping that hunger alive um, was very important to us. And the second piece is really have fun. It sounds obvious, but we really put it into action. If you'd envision what a car hobby or a car magazine looked like if you were to run an advertisement in it back in the 1990s, it would have been, we sell insurance. Hello, eight, call 800 whatever, we sell insurance, get a low rate, get a whatever. Well, does that excite you guys? It doesn't excite anybody. Insurance is like the least sexy thing you could ever talk to, talk about. So it's really started this whole campaign that we had to be very brand forward and talk to people as car people. And it started with a se series of ads. Early on, this was kind of just a reference to one. We called it the $25,000 tuna melt ad. We ran in the 1990s. It was just a picture of a tuna melt. And it was a story about how one of our competitors used to, um, they wouldn't cover you if you were not in direct, um, what do they call it, um, direct sort of possession of the car. So you literally couldn't go in and eat. And tr sure enough, a guy went into and ate a tuna melt at a diner, his Thunderbird was stolen, and they didn't pay the claim. So we called it the $25,000 tuna melt. And it was, again, just a picture of a sandwich in the middle of it. And it was, that was just this little tiny twist, a little, we, we don't, it's not really funny. Our stuff, well, I'm gonna play one of our commercials for you. You tell me if you think it's funny, but it's always meant to just have a slight twinkle in the eye. You know, because humor actually can be overplayed. It's often overplayed or it becomes kind of crass. And so our whole approach was, we're not talking about insurance ever again in our advertising or in our marketing. Where it's about what the customer wants and we're gonna do it with some sort of twinkle in the eye where there's some sort of inside story and that we would kind of understand it even if it meant making fun of ourselves. Um, some of our, these are some of our more latest print ads uh, where we're starting to do this sort of digital detox thing, kind of a little bit of an anti-technology um, play. I wish I had a couple of our brand new commercials because it's all about getting out of the office, guys putting your cell phone in the glove box, putting them away, families all ignoring each other and then going out for a drive, having a good time. Um, but it's just been this idea of sort of being forward, starting to get more newer vehicles. A lot of people didn't understand we were involved with motorcycles, um, but just having some fun with it. So here I'm gonna play, this is a series of three commercials, and I'm sorry it goes backwards, but I just I have to leave the last one for last. It's too good. So I hope the sound works, and, and we'll play it for you right now. 1970 LS6 Chevelle. 67 Ferrari 330. Skyline GTR. Boss 302. This with an L88. A 1977 Black Bandit Trans Am. Screaming chicken right on the hood. I'd have to say an Aston Martin DB4. DB5. Hey, 
I could always build a bigger garage. Even when you have your dream car, you still have a dream car. Haggerty, for people who love cars. One thing I love about this ride, when you rev the engine, it can be a little intimidating. I like that. I just like giving people the nod. Like, yeah, I know. The sound of that Hemi just gets you right here. It's my therapy on a really fast couch. I get some pretty good looks when I drive this car. Oh, do you now? The way you feel when you drive a classic is unlike any other feeling in the world. Haggerty, for people who love cars. Had some work done on the body. She racked up lots of miles, it's true. And while the paint job's a little gaudy, what's a sloven man to do? Cause I'm in love with a cougar. So old yet feels so new. I'm in love with a cougar. And now I got myself too. Got myself too. We like older models too. Haggerty. So, yeah. Uh, trust me, when we thought about that ad concept, I thought, can we do this? <laughs> Are we going to get into this? I don't know if I'd do it today. But uh, it, was, it was an awful lot of fun. Um, so the next sort of phase of our approach to building brand, again, we don't do a lot of, I mean, we do advertising, but all of our advertising, all of our promotion has always been about building brand. And build, brand building is expensive and it's hard to explain to financial people. So you have to have a lot of courage to do it because they're always going to be sitting there and asking what the ROI is. And so my approach was always from the beginning is you have to seize the high ground. In our space, knowing that we didn't want to talk about insurance, what does the high ground possibly mean? What are the adjacencies that you can do it? you could add to it. First and foremost, we knew we had to become the foremost authority in values of these cars. Um, if you'd imagine an industry like vintage car world, it's filled with classic car dealers all trying, to f all trying to sell their inventory and frankly often lying about what they think that they have, or in lying is probably too strong, inflating what they think they have. And there was no real source of uh, authentic data. So we sent out, we bought a half a dozen different small companies that were in the data and valuation space around the vintage cars and really wrapped it up into what we call our valuation tools. Uh, we now have an app that tracks all the live auctions while well that they're happening wherever they are in the world. And then we've created really the database for us. One of the big ways that I've been able to te create partners out of the all states, nationwide, farmers, progressives, is that they have no idea how to value these cars. As I explained to the CEO of Nationwide a few years ago, you know what a 69 Camaro is, right? You probably know it's the most collected Camaro of all time. And when he said yes, I said, did you know that there are 94 different variants of the 69 Camaro and the least valuables worth about about 11 grand and the most valuable is worth about eh, 1.2 million and you can't tell the difference by looking at them and but I can help and so that's how you turn a competitor into a partner so values were really important to us uh, the magazine uh, the magazine as we mentioned I now have uh, virtually all of the editorial staff of road and track working for us some of the car and drivers. I'm not, I'm not a, I don't have a lot of fans in the Hearst building in New York uh, right now, but we just decided we had to have a really high quality magazine. When all the other magazines were starting to shut down, we were going to be ramping up. Yes, there's advertising in the magazine. It's not just a house organ. It's a real publication, but I don't have the same threshold that, uh, of profit to be able to run a successful magazine that a typical publication did. So it was a gamble well worth playing. And you look like this middle story. It was written by PGA O'Rourke. We have the best writers. I mean, uh, Jay Leno's a regular contributor to our magazine. Uh, you know, all of these luminaries write regularly for us, and uh, you know, it's real. It just kind of blows my mind sometimes. Um, we do interesting activations, like down at Woodward Dream Cruise. Um, we do. This was a vow renewal. You could schedule a time to pull up, and we did a on the side of the road vow, wedding vow renewal. Um, you come up in your car, and couples could come renew their vows on the, for their anniversary. Um, we do youth programs. We do about 100 youth judging programs around the, around the country where we run them for different events where they all want to do youth programs, they don't know how to do them, and if we don't get young people into this hobby, we'll be dead someday. So activating our youth, and again, you know, you talk about seizing the high ground. How do you differentiate yourself branding-wise? It's got to be kids or puppies, right? Kids or puppies. Take your pick. We chose kids. It's a good way to go. I haven't quite figured out how to do the puppy thing yet. So maybe talk to my buddy Mark Bissell and we'll come up with carpet, car, carpet floor care or something like that. Um, anyway, um, you know, moving on, the eight, um, Kyle mentioned the Historic Vehicle Association, the HVA. 
Um, what we realized is that there's something fascinating going on in the car world. There's this imperative in all of our world about that new technology has to be better than old. And I get it. You know, new cars are amazing. I mean, a, a new Kia could just wax my 67 911S around a track. I get it. Much better. Much better. But we're getting rid of a lot of our heritage in the United States. And I, I've learned this from some very good thinkers. So we started this organization called the Historic Vehicle Association, a board and structure completely outside of us. And its sole mission is to foster the history and heritage of the automobile with decision makers and with Washington. And what started is with this idea of creating a register. Believe it or not, have you ever seen one of those uh, register of historic buildings on the side of a house? Do you know that the the Library of Congress and the Department of Interior actually contemplated cars being in it, but no one had ever put a car in it. And so we figured out how to do it, and we started putting cars on this National Vehicle Registry. And this, by the way, and we build these glass boxes, and we just stash them around in cool places. So this is the first Camaro. This was on Woodward uh, last year. Uh, this is President Taft's steam car. Um, president, he was the first president to drive. No one, certainly no one in Washington. We, it was the first car ever displayed on the National Mall. And we just, you know, we're going to be the ones putting, you know, history and heritage of the automobile out in front of it. Does it sell a policy? I don't know. I don't care. I'm taking the high road. That's what, we, that's what you have to do if you're going to go out and build brand. Uh, most recently, a project that I'm really proud of, we discovered the Bullet Mustang. Um, the, the, from the movie Bullet, Steve McQueen. Uh, took, it was about a year keeping it secret. Uh, we found it in the garage that looked just like that, and um, it, op it was also now in the National Register, and this was its grand uh, debut at the Detroit Auto Show last Sunday, a week ago Sunday, which was the, the new owner's father's di his dying wish that that car be displayed there. And so this is, these are the things we do. These are the types of activations we do. Doesn't sell, does it sell insurance? Again, I don't care. I'm trying to build brand. When I talk about the company, I'll talk about the company. When you talk about the brand, you're going to put tension in your organization. Remember the three circles. There's a natural tension between those things if you want to be successful. Um, so we do all sorts of things, you know, now. Uh, it sometimes blows my mind the different things we do. Um, you know, we're, we're a partner with Dodge. We're partners with Porsche and a bunch of different projects. A lot of sort of new OEMs are trying to tie into their own history and heritage, and they don't know how to do it. Um, and we just, you know, are sort of tailor-made to be able to make these things work um, and, and have fun building our brand. So lots of fun there. That's how you build brand. Next tension point, culture. Again, each of these things, you go too far in brand, you wipe the company out. You go too far in culture, you have a country club. So how do you balance um, this? And why does Haggerty, um, why are we able to kind of hire the types of employees that we do? Um, first and foremost, from the beginning, we don't hire for car expertise or insurance expertise. Both of them were pretty hard. We, you know, we do now and then if we need an actuary or if we need uh, somebody to do some sort of specific claim work on cars, we'll hire those people. But in general, we just hire for potential. And I believe that's you know, the truth. I believe in the human mind's ability to grow and evolve if you just show a reason for, that, if for them to want to grow and evolve. And trust me, if you're not into cars, but I put you in that world, it gets pretty interesting pretty fast. I mean, the number of like, insurance people that I've brought into my organization that end up becoming pretty wild car collectors are kind of fascinating. Um, and it, it becomes um, sort of a passion of mine to try to convert them. And then you just give them all sorts of great growth opportunities. But the main thing, and if there's anything, and I'll get into it when I talk about the YPO leadership side, is, is that you have to show employees purpose. And this is going to be especially the case if you're going to start employing a lot of millennials. Gen Xers, a little less so, but millennials for sure. They do not want to work for an organization that does not serve some higher purpose other than making profit. And it's taken me years to try. I mean, people have always sort of who've worked for us, I was sort of felt that Haggerty had a purpose, but it wasn't until I find it, finally landed on the fact when I was sitting on a stage in Vancouver, so at chairman of YPO, we had this stunning speaker come out and talk about the future of autonomous vehicles and the future of cities with autonomous vehicles. And I walked backstage to introduce myself. That was just an amazing speech, phenomenal. I wanted to meet this guy. Handed him my card, handed him my YPO card, and I handed him my Haggerty card, and he said, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna put you out of business. And I was shocked. I mean, like my mother taught me not to meet strangers that way. And, I, and he, said, he grabbed my arm. He said, really, I'm putting you out of business. You're going to have to find something else to do. And it freaked me out. 
I got to be honest, I've just never had anyone talk to me that way. And I realized our story had to improve. We have to attach our business to a, pur to, to a purpose. And our purpose is we are going to be the company that saves driving. I believe there's going to be a purpose for driving long into our future, even in, a, even in a world where there are autonomous vehicles, primarily in cities, and even after when they start spreading to suburban areas, we're going to be the company that saves driving, not just because it's a nostalgic thing like wandering a battlefield in Gettysburg, but because it's good for us. And it's good to go out and see, as Henry Ford said, God's wide open spaces with your family. Um, so it's a purpose that I can attach thousands of people to, and it's big enough that when some guy comes up to me at a, at a conference and says, I'm going to put you out of business, I'm like, I don't think so. I don't think so. You don't quite understand what this is all about. You understand a piece of it. And so that idea of, well, how do you build a culture around a purpose is you have to just repeat it constantly, right? So we've been a Rockefeller Habits company, Scaling Up. It's one of my books I recommend by Vern Harnish. Um, and if you haven't read it, read it. Go to one of his talks. He's, he's fantastic. I'll get to that in the company side. But, you know, tomorrow, for example, is our first quarterly rollout. We do four quarterly rollouts. I speak to all of the employees four times a year, um, whether they're, it's virtually or in person. And uh, we just share our purpose. You know, we're constantly talking about the purpose that we're in, what our mission is about, uh, what our objectives are. And as I'll share with you when I get to the company side, like an absolute 100% transparency with the financials of the company. And I'll, I'll explain to it a little bit while that's wh why that's important to us. In addition to those rollouts, every single employee is in a daily huddle. Um, it's critically important for us so that they're sharing, they're getting to know each other. That idea of attaching, a comp a you attach your company to purpose, to a purpose, and then you allow people to come together to get to know each other in a personal way. Our huddles aren't just about, you know, hitting business objectives, it's about sharing personal things, something that I learned uh, heavily in YPO. You got to get to know people that way. Because I don't believe there is such a thing as work-life balance. I believe there is only life. You only get life. And you decide how you're going to spend that life. You're going to be working all the time, or you're going to be, you know, not working all the time. And so you, the reality of a modern business where that starts resonating is, is that businesses are going to have to accommodate better employees who need time or issues that, that are happening at home or affecting their work. It was fine 25 years ago to sit there and say, you keep that stuff out of the office. It's not okay to say that anymore. You have to be able to identify those signals and you have to be able to re and spend, have the organizational structure to be able to help deal with those things. It's important. Um, so remember, there's only life, and that's, uh, you know, when you speak to people like that, they will run across fire for you. And, uh, you know, it's a bunch of t-shirts that people have made up. Focus on learning and growth. We're really a learning and growth organization. We have what we call Haggerty University. Uh, in addition to uh, people being able to take time, we pay for them to take classes, and uh, whether it's everything from learning Excel to meditation to uh, you know, something in the insurance space. Uh, we also have paid volunteer time off. So we do about, I think it's 22 hours a year that we actually pay somebody to go volunteer in their community. Uh, we think that that's pretty important. And again, it's all about work. We, you can't expect people to just manage the time by themselves. So you create opportunities for them to be who they really are. People do not want to be someone different at work than they are at home. So let them be who they are at home, but show them a better way to be. And that's why learning and growth is so critical for us. And so we're just constantly developing these, these ways that they can create competencies in their leadership models and their supervisory models. And as they move up the organization, that there's always a new way that they can learn and they can grow and they can develop themselves as we all can too. In addition, we have things like out in our garage in Traverse City. If you ever guys are ever up and you want to look at some cool cars, we have a restoration facility over near the airport where I buy usually totaled cars that our clients have totaled and I give them to a department as a gift and say, fix this. And so we have a professional staff that helps them figure out how to solve the problems. And so it's fascinating. You'll get, you know, our lawyers and accountants and all the different people out there who sometimes people don't even know how to use tools, just spending a little bit of time in the space that our, you know, million and what our goal is 6 million clients. And 6 million, I think, is about 2% of the population. If you can move 2% of any population, you can create a trend. That's how we're going to save driving. Um, so you got to get them behind the wheel. And we got to get them. So everybody who restores a car, typically between 100 and 150 people work on each of those projects, and they all get a chance to drive the car when it's done. It's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, we do a bunch of cool historical stuff, too. I'm going to move along. Another thing about culture, I will just say, we measure ourselves against the best. Cult culture is measurable. 
I didn't think it was when I first kind of was scaling the business. And so for us, a lot of it, you know, getting involved with, you know, things like our brand sentiment surveys, Gallup scores, we've been a great place to work company. That's been a fantastic process for us because it requires you to respond to employee surveys that are done blind. Um, same way, you know, if you're not looking at your glass door responses right now, glass door just, that's happening all the time and showing active response to those things, you're not able to measure yourself against what your employees are really looking for. I get it, Glassdoor will also be some of the cranks that leave you or that you had to fire, that's okay. People recognize that, people are smart enough to be able to get that stuff just like some of the bad restaurant reviews on Yelp, but this is our world and if you're not willing to measure yourself. Uh, but this is the number right here that I'm most proud of. We have an 87.4 net promoter score. Um, that's by far the highest net promoter score in anything like the insurance industry. Uh, the nearest is in the low 70s. Um, and this has become a weapon for us. Uh, another one of the ways that I've been able to do partnerships with companies that would never listen to us and they said, well, we're really big. Why would we deal with you? Because I have an 87 net promoter score and yours is about 40. So if you let me interact with your clients, it's gonna be the best interaction with a customer that they have had all day. You've got to let me in. And it works. If you measure it right and you do it right, these kind of measurements actually work. So 87, uh, well, 80, 87 net promoter scores work. Little tiny side, this is, the slide, this is the one slide about governance that's not about brand or culture. Um, we've been, we've had, we're an independently owned company. My sisters and I own the business as, as it stands today. Um, a closely held family company, uh, you know, scaling like crazy. Um, and I knew we needed a board. It was a bunch of my YPO buddies that convinced me we needed a real board, not just a board of advisors. So we've been now 12 years um, into having a board. It's been fantastic because it's allowed me and my team to know we can be fairly employed and compensated without worrying about a bunch of family dynamics. And so it's a real board of directors, pr predominantly seated by um, independent directors and an independent chairman. Um, I work for them. Um, I have a lot of influence, as you might imagine, but I still need to know that I can be fairly employed. And at the same time, my two sisters who haven't been actively involved with the business since it was about, I don't know, it was a small company, they need to know from the board how the company is really performing and that I'm not just off running around the world doing all this crazy stuff. And so it's really, that again, it's been an awesome piece of the puzzle for us it, uh, to have a real board and to make them part of our team. And I'm really proud to say that our board in um, 2016 won the uh, Family Business Magazine's Private uh, Company Board of the Year. Um, again, not that it's about awards, but it's just, you know, like, go figure. I didn't even know they gave board awards out. So, you know, it's kind of fun. Uh, but it just, you know, again, it, I, it was an outside process. You got to hold yourself up to certain standards. You hold, I mean, I don't know about you, but if I can measure it, I can get it done. And um, so that was kind of a fun process to go through. Finally, just briefly, and then about the company, and we'll go into leadership, little corner of part of our headquarters. Um, uh, this is an, an image I use a lot for my employees. You know, I do not, as I said, I do not have a finance background. What I learned about business, I learned on the job, even though I was a natural entrepreneur. And the chart on the, on the, on the left is how a lot of people sort of talk about growth and success in a business. I do not. I look at it like the image on the right. To me, success in business, how you grow from the core, is like peeling an onion. It's not about progressing yourself up to bigger and better. It's about finding deeper and deeper truths in who you are and what is in your business space. And so I'm often, you know, when I've been tempted many, many times to drift outside of our core, I remind people of this. We have won more and we have grown faster because of when we stick to our, our core and we just peel another layer of the onion away. Um, so it's kind of been my, in, you know, my image, like when I see all the too many finance charts going up and to the right, I like that direction too. Um, but I'd rather sit there and say, how can we get better? How can we go deeper into this? How do we dig a moat around the business so that nobody can assail us? And so, but clearly if you haven't read Peter Thiel's, um, there are a couple of books on there. One is called From Impossible to Inevitable and the other one's Peter Thiel's Zero to One. If you haven't read them, please make those your first two business books of the year that you haven't spent any time on because you really want to try to find a niche in, of some kind, whether it's geographic, whether it's product-based, something like that. And then let's just face it. This is what Peter Thiel says. You want to build a monopoly. You want to monopolize your niche. If you want to go into something and be a good competitor, good luck. I mean, because when I talk, when people always say, well, who's your nearest competitor? I'm like, I have no clue. 
I know I have a bunch of different smaller companies trying to compete with me, but I am building something else. And, you know, if you get into that competitive space, it doesn't work. And that's what Peter Thiel says. Every really successful, especially platform company, openly goes out and tries to build a monopoly in it. And he talks a lot about, um, you know, Google, for example. I mean, they talk about a monopoly. But guess what happens when you don't try to hammer them over antitrust, right? Oh, remember Yahoo? They lost it too. You know, we're, you know there's lots of players in the search game. Nonsense. They have monopoly. And we've, we've paid them to do it. Um, and we like it because of what it does for us. It's okay to think that way because the key to monopoly is not having market share. It's higher share of profit in your space. It's something I learned from Vern Harnish. It's not about market share, it's about share of profit. Um, the statistic is probably a little bit dated. Do you know what Apple's share of the mobile phone market is on the global basis? Uh, just number of units sold. It's about 10%. Do you know what their share of profit is? 73%. That's what you want. That's what you want. So right now, my insurance company happens to be the 73rd largest auto insurance company in the United States. But I bet we're about, oh, I don't know, in the 40s probably, profit-wise. I mean, you know, the top 10 is huge. I mean, these are all, you know, 20, $30 billion companies. But that's the game you want to play. And you can only get there if you just get comfortable with the fact it's not monopoly market share, it's monopoly profits. Um, so I wish I could have told myself that earlier. Another little image that I'll offer you, I tell my team all the time and we learn along the way, is you got to know your game. Some of the toughest business decisions you'll ever make is when you confuse these two moves. On the left is the game of chess and on the right is the game of Go. Two greatest ancient strategy games on the planet. But the core idea of each of them is fundamentally different. When you win in chess, it's basically a game of attacking and eliminating something, right? You attack. Um, Go do this, take this market, do whatever, create that product, do something like that. Go is fundamentally different. Go is about protecting territory. And often some of the biggest mistakes I made early on is I didn't understand when we were attacking or we were trying to protect territory. And some of the mistakes I'm still years later trying to unwind was because I, didn't, I wasn't clear about what is it we were trying to do. Take somebody out or protect what I had in an area. Might, have, might be an event space, might have been a sponsorship, might have been, I don't know what I'm trying to tell you, but just think about that if you're ever puzzling over a complex business problem that you might have. Is this a chess problem or is this a go problem? It kind of helps you think it through. Wish I had known it a little bit earlier. Clear vision and plan. I mentioned it, you know, we're big Rockefeller habits, quarterly planning. We get together for two days of planning on a quarterly basis, not two days on an annual basis. Um, if you wait to do annual planning for your organization, it's too late. Um, you will not be able to respond to the market. If you're not planning fully, and I mean full budgeting, full everything quarterly, you will not be able to respond to market demands. And I learned this years ago. If you're, if you're growing a rapidly scaling company, it's a key thing to do. Um, this is a copy of our one-page plan. I fully share this with, this is our latest version. It doesn't have any numbers in it here, um, and I would have shared them with you, but I just, I didn't have a copy of it in front of me to put in the presentation. So it's, you know, all our vision, you know, like I said, we're going to have six million members keeping driving a line. Our purpose is to save driving. Those are our values, our brand promise. Those are the same metrics that I, I have that my, or, that my, um, team shares. Every single person down in the mailroom knows what our profit levels are. They know what my salary is. That would be inappropriate, but they know what our profit levels are. I kind of put it this way when people are sometimes shocked about that, is that how, if you wanted to field a winning team in, in some sport, let's just call it like basketball, and you want to play really hard for you, but you're not going to tell them what the winning score needs to be or what their score is, how do you expect them to play hard for you? You're, it's fantasy land. That was, frankly, my parents' generation. Well, we're going to keep it all secret, and maybe we'll pass out a bonus if we did well, if we did well. Nonsense. doesn't work. Total transparency. It's been absolutely fantastic. It turns, I have a thousand entrepreneurs working for me rather than, you know, the genius with a thousand followers. Um, that's what you want. People using, and it's another thing, I, I, in my personal plan, it's most brains on the problems I have. What are the most brains I can get working on the problems I'm trying to solve? Maximum number of brains. And it's kind of fun to think about it that way. It doesn't look like a simple org chart, but it actually is. Uh, we're a matrix organization and uh, everybody knows what they have to do to bring it. F and, and you know, it's just always clear. This is just an example of kind of uh, enterprise milestones. Red, yellow, green, we keep it really simple. We can status very quickly in almost everything that we do. And um, it works. 
You know, so the real goal, again, it's kind of the final thing in business. I believe a business's goal, if you want to, if you want to focus on a niche and you want to create a monopoly, it's not to compete, it's to create, it's you want to reach escape velocity. You want to get going so fast that no one could ever catch you. And it's not that, you know, even the most, you know, monopolistic businesses can't be confronted, but I just, it's an image that I keep telling people. It's like, you got to reach escape velocity. Yeah, but what about this competitor over here? I'm like, are we really going to react to this? Or are we going to keep plunging forward? And it's just, it's a great image because what you really want to build is a rocket ship. So if you don't mind, and let me just do a time check. I'm sorry I've gone on a little while. Everybody comfortable if I go on another 10 more minutes or so real quick? Is that cool? Okay. Maybe 12. So what about you? What about you as leaders? So I'm going to spin a little bit to my YPO journey and some lessons that I learned that I, I want to share with you. So these are a few of the people that I met and spent significant time with um, along the way uh, during my YPO chairman year. And I'm going to just mention a few lessons that I learned from a few of them about. And I've kind of been working on this idea of like what the best leaders do and how I can exemplify them in somebody that I met or something that I specifically met them. You know, first and foremost, as I would say, the best leaders that I met around the world, whether it's in government, um, whether it's in social, some sort of social service, or whether it's in business, is the best leaders light the way. And uh, if you're not a sort of example to something in both the way that you live and the way that you're willing to upgrade yourself to be a kind of example for your people, it's, it's hard for people to follow you. And, um, but the reality is, is that in this age of exponential growth. We are living in an exponential time, all driven by technology. Moore's Law and all of Moore's Law's cousins from networked, uh, you know, network markets all around the world to com uh, software-driven computing problems to cloud computing to memory to everything. It's making uh, the world move at a pace that the human brain, which works in a linear fashion, not an exponential fashion, cannot possibly keep up. So the best leaders not only light the way, they give their great storytellers. If you're not actively, personally working on how you tell stories be around what's happening in the world, people are going to have a hard time following you because our job as a leader, our job as parents, our job as a community leader, when they look to you is you want, when they ask you, what does this mean that you have something to say, usually in the form of a story. And two people that I learned along the way, this is Sheikh um, Mohammed Maktoum, he's the ruler of Dubai. A fascinating guy, and it wasn't until I spent um, quite a bit of time with him about 18 months ago that I and his cabinet ministers. He doesn't his English isn't great. His cabinet ministers are all educated in the U.S. Brilliant people, and they it started right off. You know, we're trying to be the Uber of governments. I love that. The one guy said to me, you know, we don't think a government is you know, and you all hear about it. I mean, we're living in a time where national sovereignty is being questioned. There are more effective types of organizations out there than national governments, especially in their part of the world, where a lot of their borders are just lines in the sand on a the map. There isn't anything differentiating them themselves between each other. And what he is actually trying to do, I'm convinced after reading through it, he's, he's not only beloved by his people because he's lighting the way, is he's telling a story of building a great city in the Middle East. Not a great city like an ancient city, like a truly great modern city, like New York or like Singapore. And Singapore is a city that has so much gravity to it. If you've not ever been there, I'll be there in about six weeks that it's just like, it's just sucking up all of the business resources around it because it just kind of works. He's doing it by building an airline. He's building the world's best, largest, long haul airline in the world, Emirates Airlines. And even in the worst of their economic crisis, he's putting in orders for more, more Boeings because if people can't get to Dubai cheaply, he can't build a city. If he can't build a city, he's just got another country in the Middle East and it won't work. It's just brilliant guy. Another person, I spent quite a bit of time with Justin Trudeau. I was very happy that my wife stayed with me after we both spent uh, time with him because he is a very handsome guy. In fact, I must tell you that when I bumped into him in the dark hallway in the backstage when I met him, I'm like, wow, you are really good looking. Um, you know, he's a, he's a good looking dude, I got to tell you. But this is a guy who has, I was just so blown away by not only how engaging he was to his people. He, you know, talk about lighting the way and creating compelling story about what the future of Canada looks like, including the makeup of his cabinet. His cabinet is like this perfect mix, gender, ethnicity, religion, even his security team was this amazing balance. He does not leave anything to chance, anybody to pick him apart in any way. I was not allowed to meet him without news cameras presence, but he does not take private meetings because it would be inappropriate in his role. I mean, it's just brilliant how he handled himself. Um, 
Fabulous guy, a lot to learn from him as a leadership. The best leaders also build others up. Let's face it, we know this in business, it's never been more important than today. You're gonna to be measured by how you build other people's up, not how you build your balance sheet, or not how you build your P&L. Um, and those are gonna be the people that follow you and create things. Great guy, YPO member, he owns Polaroid, Bobby Sager. Uh, he's a Jewish guy, he was, uh, a number of years ago, he was at a, a Holocaust memorial opening. And as a lot, of, if you've been to one of those, they're pretty tough, it's a tough sledding to get through those things. And he was walking out, and you know, it said never again over the doorway as he was leaving. He went back to his hotel room and, you know, went to sleep. He woke up in the morning getting ready to fly out and got the newspaper outside his door and it talked about the um, genocide in Rwanda. So we're letting it happen. It is happening again. It's happening right now. We're letting it happen. That day, he went to Boston Logan and flew to Rwanda and started deciding he was going to use his fortune to start changing the world and to build people up. And he just does it. He goes to these places and does stuff like you can't even imagine. Um, so I was, I'm very happy for that. Connect the dots. So I spent a bunch of time with uh, Jim Collins early when I was getting ready for my um, YPO chairmanship, and I realized, you know, you've probably read Good to Great or, you know, his five books, which were actually not five separate books. It's actually one big research project that he dissected five different ways. But his new book is fascinating because after he wrote all those books and he went on all the speaking circuit, he realized there's a crisis of leadership in the world, and he wanted to do something about it because Peter Drucker challenged him, do something useful. Stop writing all these books. Go do something useful. And he realized we need to figure out a new way to get leaders out into the world. And he's next, believe it or not, Jim Collins' next book is going to be about high school principals. High school principals who do great things in cities in the most impossible circumstances because he said they are actually the first leaders our kids will ever see in many cases. And that's where we got to start investing, not in education as a whole, the leader of these school. It was just, it's a brilliant insight. He's connected a bunch of dots that are pretty fascinating. This is Tom Friedman, the New York Times writer that wrote The World is Flat, and most recently a book that I put on there, Thank You for Being Late, if you haven't read it. Absolutely fascinating. He was the one that helped me understand this whole idea of living in an age of exponentials and why me, as being a leader, that we need to get comfortable with telling story to help people understand this exponential change. I mean, I can tell you right now, I have three or four multi-year projects at Haggerty going on in the technology space that if I were to do nothing else, they will eliminate a significant number of jobs. It just will. That's what you do. You've got to be efficient, right? We all have to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go cut people. We're going to find places for them to start engaging our customers in different ways. We will find places for them. But everybody is doing this, and Tom Friedman helped me realize about different ways that we can connect the dots to make this exponential world a little bit more rational. Of course, leaders, the best of them, have a bias for action, not just sitting around talking about ideas. Kofi Annan was, he helped me through a problem that I had going on in YPO in the Middle East. Yes, here I am, Mr. Traverse City, Michigan, dealing with this major Middle Eastern problem, a conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And, you know, he started telling me about the best way to get action moving on something like this is to go into individual communities and start getting people talking at a local level, not by some sort of national policy basis. He had a bias for action that it was the only way where real leadership starts. Um, the best leaders seek maximum impact. Um, this is uh, um, former president of Ecuador, Jamil uh, Mahoud. He's now a professor at Harvard. Um, if you ever want to read an amazing story, he taught me, he in one chart showed me a lot about the number one reason why you'd never want to be president of a Latin American country, I can tell you that much. But it was all about this idea of seeking maximum impact when you have almost no resources and your country's about to go to war and all the rich people just took all the money to Miami and you have a riot going on over here and Peru is about to blow us over. What can you do to seek maximum impact? It was just absolutely phenomenal story. I spent about an hour um, last um, interview, I did an, about an hour long interview with um, Secretary Clinton about two months, three months after uh, she, her loss in the election. Uh, I was asked to come in and do this. It was kind of a polarizing thing to do in YPO. YPO doesn't do politics. Um, and if this interview took place about two blocks away from Trump Tower and it happened to be the first afternoon that President Trump had been back in New York since the election. And so she got stuck in traffic and she was a little miffed, um, I must tell you, that day. Um, but I must say that even though um, I found her very tough to read, and in fact I've gone back to look at the 
the video about three times to fully look at the interview. Um, she impressed a lot of the people who were there in the room because of her discussion about maximum impact. What are the things that we need to be doing as individual leaders to create impact across the world regardless of politics? And I really appreciated her for it. Um, I decided to treat the interview not as a presidential election loser, but rather as Secretary of the United States because she had a lot to say. And the second thing is kind of, she kind of got heated. I'd say, hey, Secretary Clinton, I have a question here from my friend Vineet from uh, Delhi, and he'd love to know what you think about India-China relations. And she would just say, you want me to do that in about 90 seconds? I'm like, 90 seconds would be great, so, uh, you know, Madam Secretary. And just bang, she could do it. I mean, it, just remarkable mind, a remarkable mind. But I will tell you, tough to read. Um, David Rubenstein, if you haven't met him or heard his story, he's got a great show right now. He's co-founder of, uh, or co-CEO or whatever of Carlisle. He's a multi-billionaire. But he has decided that his impact is going to be, instead of just enriching himself with, you know, sort of needless things, is that he was going to start buying documents and things of historic significance to put them on display for America. And that's where he first bought a copy of the Magna Carta. I believe he has one of the copies of the Constitution, actually, and he also helped um, restore the Lincoln Memorial. Told me a funny story about how when he just decided to do it, they couldn't, the government wasn't giving any money, he restored it, and they let him go up in the, um, to the tip and sign it. And uh, that day when the, somebody in Congress said, uh, hey, you don't have to do that, you know, we're willing to pay for half. And he's like, really? You know, I go on the news, you're letting, gonna let me pay for half. But I was so impressed that, you know, he was willing to do it without thanks and that he just thought it was something important, that the impact he could have on the next generation by doing something important, investing millions of dollars in these public objects. Um, so uh, the best leaders also have big themes, but with laser-like actions. Um, big themes, big stories, but laser focus in their actions. So this is Abhijit Pawar. He's uh, one of the wealthiest um, guys in India. Um, and comes from one of those kind of Maharaja families. I remember never. I remember sitting with next to him on a bus, and he's like in jeans. I'm in the jeans. You know, we're going out for this kind of dinner. I'm like, hey, what do you do? And you know, it suddenly realized he's like uh, he does everything. You know, I mean, hotels and manufacturing and banking and insurance and pretty much runs the huge part of India. And uh, but what his passion is is education for um, young girls and women in India, especially in areas where there's a high level of illiteracy. And when I talk about, we all like to do things like that, big themes, but he came up with a way to do it. And his answer was, in these small villages, is it was the grandmas. If you can get to the grandmas, you can change a village. Because he said, imagine this. You know, in a small village out there, all the girls and all the women, they're all illiterate. They do not read, they, and they're not often allowed to go to school. The boys may get to go to school, and the men work, while the women, you know, are working in the house. And in particular, the little kids are all kept by the grandmas. The grandmas will kind of get the little kids together, and particularly the little girls, and they'll kind of take care of them. And he realized, if I could teach the grandmas to read, they'll teach their daughters to read, and all the girls in the village will start being able to read. So he created this reading program all through these poor villages in India where he only teaches grandmas how to read. And he's just changed the world. There's this picture of him with like these 10,000 grandmas. Um, it's, just, it's just awesome, laser focused. Big ideas, laser focus. The idea of the best leaders I know are not afraid of the future, they welcome it and they teach people to adapt. This is the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. Um, Sadiq was fascinating, um, first uh, Muslim mayor of London. And he only mentioned one number the whole time, other than tell, reminding us about six times that London is the greatest city on the planet. I get that. I, you know, I, I like his uh, being a fan of London. But what he said is simply this. I only have one number that I'm going to share with you, and it drives all my action. London is going from 8 million people to 12 million people by 2030, and we're not ready. 8 million to, tw uh, 8 million to 12. And he said, I can't afford to be political. The next mayor can't afford to be political. We have to solve real problems. We have to adapt to this future because the future is cities. The biggest single megatrend that's happening in the world is that 60% of the global GDP will be coming out of the top five, top 25 megacities by 2030. And London will be one of them and he wants it to be ready. It's a pretty fascinating guy. Um, Obviously, we all know that it's not about knowledge, it's about learning. It's about how you learn, how you can supercharge your learning. Uh, this guy is Yuval Noah Harari, greatest mind I've ever, individual mind I've ever been countered in my life. He wrote the book Sapiens. It was uh, Barack Obama and Bill Gates' top 10 books of their life or whatever, you know, changed their life. If you haven't read Sapiens, it's 
70,000 years of human history in about 300 pages, and it's all about the cognitive revolution, about how we, there is not a chance that what we're doing today came about, came about any way but a massive cognitive revolution. It's because it's about the way we learn, not what we know. And the best leaders never fear rewiring themselves. This is uh, Andre Borschberg. He's a YPO member out of um, uh, uh, Switzerland. And he created that solar um, impulse plane that flew around the world. Remember that thing on the news a couple years ago? The amazing thing about this is not only did he fund this project, there was not a single piece of engineering in the whole thing that existed in the world before he did it. He created the entire thing, down to the avionics, down to the motors, down to the type of carbon fiber, everything. But the most incredible thing is about how he had to rewire himself to learn how to fly it. Because he's a pilot, he was a fighter pilot in the Swiss Air Force, or whatever. who knew the Swiss had an Air Force? But um, anyway, the, the most epic flight that he had to take was from Japan to Hawaii. And it was going to take five days. And the plane charges during the day and then it has to run on its batteries at night. So you, can never, you can't sleep for more than 20 minutes. And so what he basically had to do preparing for that flight is he had to become a master meditator. Which, by the way, a lot of the best leaders I encountered around the world have some sort of meditation discipline. But this is not like a little bit of a, hey, I, five days a week I sit for 10 minutes. This is like a master level, like Zen master of meditation. Because he had to be able to survive that time when, because the autopilot would get it blown off course. So he takes off a day into the flight. The autopilot breaks. His team from around the world said, you have to turn back. We can't keep you alive. We can't guarantee that you'll make it. And he said, I can do it. He got a global conference call while he was flying this plane with all of his teams around the world. He said, I trained for this. The plane can handle it. I'm going to do it. So at the end of day five, he finally is approaching at night, about midnight, the Hawaiian Islands. He can see the lights out there in the distance, and they're already, they've closed down the Honolulu runway for him to land. And he said, the islands were so beautiful, I decided to fly around all night long to look at how pretty the islands were and to land at sunrise, you know, because that was a master. I mean, that's a mind that's, that's amazing, and he wasn't afraid to rewire himself. Finally, I just want to say if there's anything I learned about you know, my time in, in YPO, I could pretty much say this, dream big. And um, this, this concept was really shared me, by me. I, was, I took a trip to Israel and Palestine last spring. This is um, Shimon Peres, the famous Shimon Peres, prime minister and president of Israel's son. Chemi is his name, spelled like Chemi. And uh, I had dinner with him, and we talked a lot about, you know, being you know, living in this legacy of, uh, you know, great father, a great statesman, and a, and a guy who really helped create the, the country. And what he was most proud of was this, this quote that his father had, which is, you know, the greatest mistake was that our dreams were too small, and that if you dream of great things, um, because if you dream of great things, and, and you will achieve them. And the point is this. You're all successful people here. We're all successful people. Every single person in this room has a track record of achieving probably better than most of your peers were growing up. You guys are doing stuff that's different at a bigger pace, at a higher level, seeing more of the world than most people you grew up with. And the reality is with people that achieve stuff, but you achieve something and the dream is too small, you'll be disappointed. And so his point was this, if you have big dreams and you're an achiever, you'll probably do even greater things. So always dream really big and you can't lose as a leader. Um, and so I just, I loved the context of that quote, and I thought I'd finish with it. So finally I say, you know, why excellence? Why did I say the road to excellence for my, my journey with, with Haggerty? Um, is, it's this idea of erite. It's that Greek idea of I wake up every single morning. I have a routine that I follow through every day, try to stick with it, you know, seven days a week and, and at night the same way. Um, and I'm just trying to get a little bit better every day. And I... I I can't believe the things I've been able to do, the way we've been able to scale a business, Haggerty around the world, um, and what I was able to see from and learn from some of these great leaders. I can't wait to start putting it into action. Um, and someday, you know, maybe if you come up and see me, you'll be able to see that's kind of what the Porsche looks like today. If you'd like to come visit, I'd be happy to show you around um, up in Traverse City. But uh, it's been a great ride. And whether it's truly, you know, I'm at the point of excellence, I think I probably have a long way to go, and I look forward to just turn 50. I'm looking forward to the second half of my life because uh, the first half has been pretty amazing. So thank you very much.